Welcome to the 2021 Senior Fellowship Symposium. My name is Margaret Fennell, and I'm the Director of Undergraduate Advising and Research. We are here virtually to celebrate this year's five senior fellows. Since many of you probably don't know much about the Senior Fellowship Program, I'm going to start by giving a short introduction to the program, what it is and how it came to be. That will be followed by individual presentations from each of the five senior fellows, and then we'll have a group discussion about the experience of being a senior fellow over the past year. The Senior Fellowship Program is unique to Dartmouth College, and only a small number of students are selected each year to be senior fellows. Those who are awarded senior fellowships work independently on a large-scale project of their own design for three terms. Fellows are not required to enroll in courses during senior year, nor are they required to complete a major. Each fellow has one or more faculty advisors, depending on the nature of the project. As you will hear, some senior fellowships are large-scale projects within a discipline, and other projects are truly interdisciplinary. The subheading here on this slide, The Undisciplinables, is the name of the book about the Senior Fellowship Program, and it refers both to the fact that the Senior Fellowship Program is outside of any traditional academic department, but it also refers to the spirit of the program, which, as you will hear, was established to provide freedom from the constraints of academia. So this is Ernest Martin Hopkins, and the Senior Fellowship Program was the brainchild of President Hopkins, and he was president of Dartmouth College from 1916 until 1945. What's interesting about him is that he was not an academic. He was a businessman, and he wasn't even a traditional businessman. He was known for being experimental and freewheeling. One of his goals as president of the college was to expose students to new and unwelcome ideas. He mandated a compulsory course in citizenship, which was intended to counteract the conventional conservative mindset of the time. He also established a compulsory course in evolution, and some families were so appalled that they actually withdrew their sons from college. The Senior Fellowship grew out of his mission to challenge traditional educational approaches. As a senior fellow from the class of 1931 said, I am inclined to believe that President Hopkins wanted to keep the door open to a certain kind of rebelliousness, a certain kind of misfit, if you will. So Hopkins really saw himself as a reformer, and his mission was to cut through traditional rules and regulations to give students true academic freedom. And he really intended the senior fellowships to be a year entirely free from academic constraints and regulations. And here are some quotes that illustrate his vision for education. We have had more laws and regulations and rules than were necessary to run a principality. And for 13 years now, I have spent a large part of my time in knocking these down and getting rid of them. So far as my educational interest lies, my whole objective is to get the college recognized as a place where men are expected to stand on their own feet, and if they cannot do this, to take responsibility for falling down. And when he established the Senior Fellowship Program, he said this about it. I prize this particular project because at least it is an eloquent gesture. So this is a picture on the right-hand side of the Dartmouth Charter. And President Hopkins wanted freedom for the senior fellowships, including freedom from faculty oversight. He knew the faculty would actually hate the idea. So he did an end run around the faculty and went straight to the Board of Trustees with his plan to get their approval. Initially, senior fellows were not required to complete a project or even report to a faculty advisor. They really could do anything they wanted, take classes or not, work on a specific project or not, and over the years, the program has been revised to add more faculty oversight, as well as a requirement to complete a project. And in fact, faculty involvement in the program increased to the point where Hopkins considered his original idea to be fatally compromised. The senior fellowships were established by a vote of the trustees of Dartmouth College on April 2, 1929. And although the program has changed over the years, what is as true today as it was over 90 years ago is the idea that senior fellows are responsible for their own learning. And so here is what the, was the original vote of the trustees in 1929. In order that added stimulus may be given to the genuine spirit of scholarly attainment in undergraduate life, and that the cultural motives of the liberal arts college may be emphasized, and in order that the tendencies of the honors courses toward freedom from routine requirements 
may be carried to further development in the cases of men outstandingly competent to utilize such freedom. And further, that illustration may be given in the undergraduate body that the acquisition of learning is made possible largely by individual search and to but minor degree by institutional coercion. That there be hereby established the senior fellowships of Dartmouth College. And one side note about all of this language in quotes is that this was obviously established in a period when Dartmouth was all male. So now it is clearly a co-ed program and a co-ed college. So these are pictures of uh, Baker Library on the left and the Paul Room in Baker Library on the right hand side. And one of the perks of being a senior fellow is having an office in the Paul Room, which is in Baker Library. The Paul Room and the individual studies are memorial to Carol Paul, who was Dartmouth class of 1903 and also Thayer class of 1904. He was a personal friend of President Hopkins and was particularly interested in the senior fellowship program from the beginning. He was a great supporter of it throughout his life. When he died in 1937, his wife worked with President Hopkins as well as the librarian of the college to design a memorial to him in the library. So the space consists of that central room in the picture there, flanked by six private studies. And the central room has this paneling of, of friezes and this arched ceiling. And if you want to see more pictures of the Paul Room or learn more about it, there's a web page about it on the library's website. So these are pictures of a couple of notable past senior fellows. Nelson Rockefeller on the left-hand side, he was the class of 1930, and he was in the first class of senior fellows. He had finished his honors thesis in his junior year in economics and um, studied art for his fellowship year. Peter C. in the middle there is, uh, was class of 1984. He's currently a professor at Dartmouth in the Psychological and Brain Sciences Department. He studies the neural basis of consciousness now, but the title of his senior fellowship was The Process Philosophy of Quantum Theory, which was kind of a combination of physics and philosophy. On the right-hand side is Kirsten Gillibrand, um, class of 1988, and she was known as Tina Rutnick when she was at Dartmouth. She was on both the squash and tennis teams and is currently a U.S. Senator representing the state of New York. She had taken over Hillary Clinton's seat in 2008 when uh, President Obama nominated Clinton to be Secretary of State. Her senior fellowship project was titled The Chinese Communist Occupation of Tibet. And remember that Undisciplinables book I mentioned at the beginning of this intro? So senior fellows were invited to send in quotes or letters about their experience as senior fellows, and those were included in the book. And Gillibrand wrote this, reining in creative energies and distilling a unified work not only was challenging, but was invigorating. The opportunity to take on that kind of challenge provided me with an incomparable experience that prepared me for my future in a way that traditional academics could not. And this is one more notable senior fellow, Jerry Kaminsky, class of 1961. And the current senior fellows have funding for their projects because of an endowment from Jerry Kaminsky. He was a senior fellow and he did his project in economics and his, he, what he thought he wanted to do was go to graduate school after college to get a doctor in economics and go into academia and that fellowship year was preparation for that. Over the course of the year though, he realized that he was not cut out to be an academic and so instead of going to graduate school, he went into finance and his success in the world of finance is why senior fellows have the financial resources to complete these projects because even though he didn't end up doing what he had planned, um, with his career after that, he really felt that the senior fellowship year was an incredibly important way for students to figure out what they want and what they like. So before I introduce this year's senior fellows, I want to acknowledge the Faculty Committee on Senior Fellowships. The committee is responsible for the oversight of the senior fellowship program. Each spring they review applications for the program and nominate students for final selection by President Hanlon. And they also monitor the progress of the fellows throughout the year and they determine final honors at the end of the year. They take these responsibilities very seriously and they collectively put in many hours during their terms on the committee. And the one person who puts in more hours than the committee is Jean Briand, Assistant Director of Undergraduate Advising and Research. She works behind the scenes with the fellows to coordinate offices, budgets, deadlines, and so much more. And in addition, each of the senior fellows has one or more faculty advisor who guides them throughout the year, and you're going to hear more about the role of the faculty mentors from each of the fellows.
Next, you are going to hear from each of the senior fellows. They're going to give you a short presentation about their project that will be followed by a group discussion about their year as senior fellows, why they chose to pursue this non-traditional path, what it was like to spend a year on a large-scale project of their own design, and what they plan to do after graduation. So here's the list of this year's senior fellows, Muriel Ammon, Theo Green, Kenzie Kaku, Jordan McDonald, and Michael McGovern. Hey, I'm Kale, Muriel Hosek Ammon Holia, Sailing Ho Achte, Slayout de Mess, Dachwalachting Ceylon, Hanover, New Hampshire, Suchdai. Rumalio Netin, Yat Delt Se Netin, Hai Slaydachting Olia, Slayout Ding, Yadakanil and Se Nanningat Ding, Hoanke, Jishdamat Ding, Taika Misting. We're Honda Metro Altate, Olia Dartmouth College, Kuan Yat Nyan Mehane Hoi Uhyo. Hello, my name is Muriel Ammon. My senior fellowship is on Kuan Yat Nyan Mehane Hoi Revitalization, Hoopa Language Revitalization, in the context of early childhood education and community wellness. I employ biocultural sovereignty, which has been written about by Dr. Ketcha Rizingbaldi in regards to my home and my community. My methodology is Pleiku Flau Oltset, a Hoopa knowledge gathering practice written about by Dr. Sarah Chase Merrick in junction with her aunt and fluent speaker, Verdina Parker. I have come to think about why it is important to be able to learn a heritage language that has been impacted by colonization. For my people, learning Kiwinyaknyan Mehaneahue is a form of empowerment. It helps us to live in a good way and it can heal intergenerational trauma. Looking at Hoopa language revitalization in terms of school systems, there is a history of boarding school violence attacking not only our language, but the bonds we had as community members and as family members. I am interested in how Hoopa language revitalization can act as a way to help rebuild and bolster community and family relationships. After speaking with Wamalio, my family and friends, I identified three main relationships that I highlight in my work. Parent to child, grandparent to child, and children among their peers. Across the world, early childhood education is used as a means of indigenous language revitalization. Some communities have used traditional education models and other communities have used alternative education methods, all to help their language and their community grow. I am interested in how we can look at the experiences of these other indigenous communities to consider a future of Hoopa language education. Set Dia. Hi, my name is Theo Green. I'm a 21 and I'm an earth science major. My senior fellowship project is called On Large Igneous Provinces and Phanerozoic Extinctions, and I worked with Professor Brennan Keller and Professor Sarah Slotsnick in the Earth Science Department. The point of the project to, was to look into the causes of extinction events, especially the six mass extinctions that are found over the past 540 million years of geologic time. The main theories for the causes of these extinctions have been asteroid impacts, like the famous Chicxulub impactor that is related to the death of the non-avian dinosaurs, and the eruption of significant volcanic provinces. As geochronology, the dating of these events has gotten better and better, the correlation between asteroids and extinction has not really held up to scrutiny, whereas the qualitative correlation between eruptions and extinction events has continued to hold some weight. So these eruptions in particular are called large igneous provinces, and they are about 100,000 times larger than the biggest modern volcanic eruptions like Mount St. Helens or Mount Tambora or Mount Pinatubo. They're found in the continents and, on the, and in the oceans, but uh, the continental ones are generally considered more impactful because they are able to release ash and carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide and other sorts of uh, volatiles into the atmosphere and perturb the Earth system in a way that can't really be accounted for through normal processes. Generally, it's thought that this leads to extinctions. 
So the major questions for my project is, is the observed relationship between these large igneous provinces and extinctions more than chance? Can we actually quantify that relationship and say something robust about it instead of it just being a qualitative relationship? And then what factors about an eruption influence that relationship most strongly? To begin with, we worked on quantifying the temporal coincidence between a extinction time period and the eruption of a large igneous province. And so we did some statistical analyses that allowed us to put a single number onto how likely the whole list of large igneous province eruptions and the whole list of extinction events is to coincide. So once we had that number, we were able to do a series of uh, Monte Carlo simulations that allowed us to generate um, simulated lists of extinctions and compare that to the existing large igneous province record and see how many of those uh, random relationships showed the same or better relationship than what we actually observed in the real geologic record. And very, very few of them did uh, have a better relationship. And so this tells us that it is more than chance that the events line up in this way. It implies a sort of causality between the eruption of these large igneous provinces and the resulting extinctions. We also then looked into the factors about an eruption that make it more impactful, especially what might separate mass extinction related large igneous provinces from those associated with more minor extinction events. And the most important control that we identified was this bulk eruptive rate. Um, so it is not just the size of a province or just how fast it erupts, but a combination of those two factors that produces a linear relationship to how severe an extinction ends up being. And then the next sort of level of that that we wanted to look at um, was the paleo latitude of these eruptions, where they actually occurred on Earth. Modern volcanic eruptions have stronger climate impacts if they occur in the tropical region within 30 degrees of the equator. So we wanted to see if that same sort of trend held for uh, these earlier larger events. And so we used plate tectonic reconstructions to see where the provinces would have actually erupted. And these maps are some of those reconstructions for some of the most famous large igneous provinces. And we then repeated the same uh, quantification analysis of the previous section, but this time we split up the large igneous province list into three different categories for tropical eruptions, mid-latitude eruptions, and high-latitude eruptions. And what we ended up finding was that the tropical eruptions were the most strongly related to extinctions. The higher latitude eruptions were closer to the value that you would see just from random chance. So tropical eruptions seem to be the most uh, likely to perturb the Earth system in a way that results in a mass extinction or an extinction in general. And so all of the ones that I have circled here are tropical eruptions that have pretty significant extinctions related to them. Uh, so in conclusion, we found that continental large igneous provinces act as drivers of Phanerozoic extinctions, especially the six mass extinctions, and that the eruptive rate is the most significant control on the environmental effects of a given eruption but that tropical eruptions also play a role. It is not as significant or as strong as the eruptive rate influence, but they are more strongly tied to extinctions than higher latitude eruptions. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you to my advisors, Professor Keller and Professor Slotsnick for working with me on this project and to everyone who has been involved in this work. Hi everyone, my name is Kenzie and I'm from the class of 22. The focus of my senior fellowship project is development of a platform that enables rapid mapping of the fine specificities of antibodies that are elicited by SARS-CoV-2 infection and vaccination. And so in addition to the senior fellowship, I am also majoring in biology. And the inspiration for this project emerged not only because of the relevance and potential for direct applications of research, but also because one of the key challenges 
that emerged during this pandemic was how do we study and understand antibodies that are isolated from COVID infection at high resolution, but also to do it efficiently or in a high throughput manner. And so a lot of the existing approaches, some of which I've briefly highlighted in the rectangles here, um, have a trade-off between resolution and throughput. So some of them are provide very high resolution information in terms of how the antibody is binding to the spike protein, but those are often low throughput and that you can only um, really analyze one or two antibodies at once and also it takes a very long time to be able to get the data. And in contrast, if you're looking at more high throughput methods, a lot of them only give you a very broad idea of where the antibodies are binding and not exactly the specific epitopes or amino acids that the antibody is engaged in. And so what I wanted to do was to combine and balance these two factors as much as possible so that we have a way to very quickly analyze hundreds of antibodies or a patient serum at the same time. And so approach that I came up with highlighted briefly over here where for example, you can have a panel of different proteins that was designed to have specific parts of it be mutated so that antibodies can no longer bind there. And when you combine all of them in a pool, you can assess how antibodies are binding to each of these probes. And from there, you can, for instance, either look at monoclonal antibodies, so either one antibody at a time, or look at the general serum that's elicited by infection or vaccination. And the information that you can get from the monoclonal antibodies is that you can start to relate structure and the function of antibodies by mapping the epitope of these antibodies directly to where, they, uh, to where it binds on the spike protein. And in terms of the serum, you can start to determine which areas of the protein are most likely to be targeted by antibodies. And since those sites are often under the highest selective pressure for the virus to mutate, you can start to, to, for example, deduce which um, the sites in which escape variants are most likely to emerge. And a lot of the data also lines up with what we've seen with in terms of the South African variant or um, the variant in Brazil in that many of those mutations on the spike protein are located in sites that are under the highest selective pressure because they are most likely to be targeted by antibodies. And so I worked with Dr. Margie Ackerman in her lab at the Thayer School of Engineering. And the first portion of the project was focused on setting up a platform that can easily express and purify many of the protein probes that I would need. And so I try to utilize a well-established yeast-based method of modifying that system to enable chemical modifications and release of the protein from yeast, and then be able to directly extract them from the yeast culture. And so in this way, we can skip many of the time consuming steps that are required during the normal purification process to be able to sample 50 or 100 of these protein constructs at the same time. And the second portion of the research involves the structure guided design of exactly these, what these probes will turn out to be. And for that, I use an analysis of 500,000 sequences of the SARS-CoV-2 virus to determine the mutations that exist in circulating variants, and then taking that a step further with computational modeling to introduce additional mutations. And so these design proteins and function as probes to map which amino acids are being directly engaged by the antibody. And so I'm in the middle of my second term of the senior fellowship project and actively working on both portions of the project so I hope to have exciting results to share by the end of the summer. And yeah, thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Jordan McDonald, class of 2021. I'm a history major modified with English and creative writing, art history, and African and African American studies. The title of my senior fellowship project is Trust and Believe, The Black Indoors, Popular Skepticism, and the Critical Inheritance of the House Slave. My project began with a research trip that spurred a number of questions. With the support of the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship, in January 2020, I visited New Orleans, Louisiana to see some of the country's most iconic plantations, and most importantly, to listen to the narratives being constructed on plantation tours. 
Since the 1950s, Louisiana and its elaborate plantations have served as crucial production sites for numerous films in the slavery cinema canon. Django Unchained, The Skeleton Key, Mandingo, and The Beguile, just to name a few. And though these guided in-person dialogues often lack the cinematics of the big screen, these plantation tours serve as a crucial reminder that the violence inflicted on slaves and their descendants persists in the narrative work of storytelling. At the Whitney Plantation in Edgar, Louisiana, I listened to my white tour guide's scripted accounts of enslaved life and quickly found myself disturbed by the narrative platitudes that structured the stories told about slaves. At one point in the tour, the guide pivoted his speech to tell the group about a house slave who lived on the plantation. I imagine he thought the story would be a reprieve. As he spoke about the enslaved girl in question, he assured us of her heightened status, remarking upon how she often slept at the foot of the mistress's bed. Purchased as a pet companion for the mistress, she was always expected to stay close to her captor. And according to our guide, she lived a pretty good life until she was raped by her mistress's brother. As he went on to speak of the child born to this house slave, a boy whose descendants would come to make up members of the city's black elites, I struggled to find the words to rebut the narrative violence he had perpetrated. What volume of psychic terror must one disregard to speak the words pretty good where the life of a domestic slave is concerned? What is the meaning of the word until when there is no contingency for the slave? What of the gratuitous violence of slavery that did not produce children but bore other unspeakable offspring? What harm is done through these efforts at redemption? Whose redemption are we seeking when we romanticize the slave's relation to their master? With these questions in mind, I began this project by committing myself to disavowing notions of proof or evidence of the house slave's plunder. My project, Trust and Believe, operates on the foundational claim the house slave's condition and the condition of all slaves is a deadly one where both violence and suffering are endemic to slavery, full stop. I developed this project, which consists of an essay collection and a digital exhibition as an opportunity to wrestle with our contemporary attachments to this American narrative configuration and to investigate the narrative's purchase rather than prove its legitimacy. After all our years of smack talk, Trust and Believe argues that it is high time we ask ourselves what it means to judge the slave. Or in the words of literary and critical theorist Stephen Best, it passes as for an unassailable truth that the slave past provides an explanatory prism for understanding the Black political present. And though Best troubles the centrality of slavery within popular understandings of Blackness in the Americas, my project addresses the significance of the slave past head on and illuminates the ways in which a slave present has been forged through our rhetorical, artistic, and political practices. Taking Black visual culture and popular culture seriously, my project looks at film, TV, music videos, and public controversies where the house slave and its narrative tropes are invoked explicitly and implicitly. Trust and Believe analyzes the traces of the house slave that permeate the Black political present, as well as the political discourses of non-Black people who cite the slave. In one essay entitled The Long 2010s and the Cinematics of Black Betrayal, I look at a number of visual, visual productions from the end of the Obama administration in 2017 on into the early 2020s, beginning with Jordan Peele's 2017 Oscar-winning blockbuster, Get Out. From there, I look at other black directed and or written films of the long 2010s, such as Black Panther, Sorry to Bother You, Black Klansman, The Hate You Give, Native Son, Harriet, and more. In reading these films, I highlight the ways that interracial angst and anxiety are often portrayed within the confines of the domestic sphere or other kinds of institutional enclosures associated with narratives of infiltration, incorporation, collaboration, and membership. Through their insistence on reifying the interior, the inside, and the domestic as a site of these potential betrayals, I argue that these films can be understood as narrative legacies of the house slave caricature. Combining the work of a historian, a critic, and a curator, my project An approach to this project was in highly creative, interdisciplinary, and intellectually rigorous, as well as rewarding. In the end, I was able to produce a project that not only that not only considers the usage of the house slave as an insult, but takes seriously the need for a structural critique of betrayal, and in doing so, surveys the mess we've made in our moral judgments of the house slave as an eternal political coward. The senior fellowship gave me the resources to bring this project to life in the way I had always wanted to. And for that, I'm very grateful. Thank you to Ugar for this opportunity and thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Mike McGovern, class of 2021. The title of my senior fellowship project is The Tiger Tool, the complex relationship between charismatic megafauna and the communities around them. Outside of my senior fellowship, 
I'm an environmental studies major, and I also study economics. For my senior fellowship, I'm researching big cat conservation through two primary lenses, ecotourism and social media. To be more specific, I'm looking into how ecotourism and social media can be leveraged as tools to promote conservation as well as sustainable economic development in local areas. To frame my research, I selected two cats to focus in on these ideas. I picked tigers and mountain lions. Tigers, because of my extensive background with these cats, spanning back to when I was 16 years old and first began filming a documentary about them. But also because tigers are the face of wildlife conservation media. As one of the most famous endangered species, they're constantly featured in wildlife documentaries as well as social media and are a perfect cat to really dissect the relationship between humans and big cats from a perspective of ecotourism as well as media. Cougars, on the other hand, are much less familiar with the limelight. As a cat that's not officially listed as endangered, they're rarely featured in a lot of these large media productions and are much less covered in social media. As for the actual work I was conducting on my senior fellowship, I would break it up into three main categories. The first of which was a literary review of the existing writing out there about big cat conservation and big cat media. Because this is a field that has not been researched as widely as other areas in environmental studies, I knew I was going to need to have two other components to help me dive deeper into the material. The second thing that I did, which helped me get that deeper perspective, was conducting my own expert interviews with people in the field. This included government officials, as well as leaders in business industry and frontline conservationists working to protect both tigers and mountain lions. The third and most exciting component of my work was actually going in the field with those frontline conservationists as well as big cat media specialists to see what the front lines of big cat media and conservation really look like. I was able to do this in India and Indonesia through my stamp scholarship prior to the beginning of my senior fellowship and then again in the Western United States and Colorado, as well as in New Hampshire and Vermont, looking at other cats like lynx and bobcats. But overall, I got a lot of field experience working with these people, which really helped me get a better perspective on what it's like to protect cats in the wild. A big part of my final project was making the results of my research accessible and engaging to a larger group of people. To do this, I created the Tiger Tool a website dedicated to sharing news and information about big cat conservation and big cat media with the world. I leveraged my social media platforms, such as Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, to get this information website out to a larger group of people. I was fortunate enough over the course of my senior fellowship to have hundreds of visitors to my website. They were able to read the articles as well as news reports that I wrote covering this topic. An exciting evolution of the work that I've done with my senior fellowship, as well as the Tiger Tool, comes from the work that I've been doing with Big Cat Voices. Big Cat Voices is an organization I started with several other members of the National Geographic community that's focused on bringing Big Cat media to a larger group of people. I'm extremely excited to have made this nonprofit organization that will allow me to continue the work I've done with the Senior Fellowship into my time after Dartmouth. As a whole, the past several months have allowed me to delve deeper into an issue that I care about both personally as well as academically. I'm very grateful for this opportunity, and I can't thank undergraduate research enough. So what I'm going to have you do is each introduce yourself, say your name and your advisor and the title of your project. So Muriel, let's start with you. Hey, Young. My name is Muriel Hosek Ammon. My fellowship is about Hoopa language revitalization with um, education for preschool. My advisor is Nicholas Rio in the Native American Studies and EMBS departments. Theo. Uh, hi, my name is Theo. I uh, did a project on volcanic provinces called Larger Genius Provinces and uh, Extinctions. I worked with Professor Brennan Keller and Sarah Slotznik in the Earth Science Department. And Kenzie. Hi, I'm Kenzie, and I worked with Dr. Margaret Ackerman, Margie, in the uh, Department of Engineering at Sayer, and my project was focused on SARS-CoV-2 and specifically trying to map, coming up with a rapid way to map um, patient and vaccinated people's antibody response to specific parts of the um, spike protein on the virus. Yeah. Jordan. 
Hi, my name is Jordan Talia McDonald. I did my project um, with, alongside professors Bethany Morton and uh, Professor Joshua Bennett in the history and English departments respectively. And uh, my project looked at the pejorative use of house slave as a term and uh, popular representations of interracial betrayal in black popular culture. And Mike. My name is Michael or Mike McGovern. Um, and I did my project with Professor Ross Jones in the Environmental Studies Department. And the focus of my project was looking at the relationship between tigers as well as cougars um, and the communities around them with regard to ecotourism, social media, conservation, legal protections, um, and a few other areas. So these are all really, really different projects. So I'm curious about when you decided to do a senior fellowship, like at what point during your years at Dartmouth and why? So Theo, let's jump in with you. Sure. Um, I started working with Professor Keller when he got to Dartmouth during my sophomore spring. And we started working on this sort of work with large igneous provinces. And I just got very interested in it and have spent the past couple of years, you know, doing that sort of work. And it wound up being a project that I thought would be uh, larger than what I would be able to do as a regular senior thesis. And there were things that I wanted to add on to it, especially when Professor Slotznik arrived during my junior uh, winter. So we just kind of built up the project together over time and uh, it ended up being a lot of fun to work on together. And Kenzie, how did you get started on a senior fellowship? Yeah, so my, from freshman year, I had started working in Dr. Ackerman's lab but focusing on HIV. And so I had been kind of working in HIV for the last whatever two, one to two years. And then also taking classes in the area of bioengineering and protein engineering. And I guess by the time the COVID pandemic hit the United States, I was kind of at this junction where I had already taken a lot of the classes that I was interested in. And then with SARS-CoV-2, it was like this, fascinating, I guess, area that fit right into what I have been doing with HIV and a lot of the research and technology that like our lab and like myself, and of course, as a whole field had built up with HIV was able to be rapidly translated to COVID research. And it was just so exciting to have such fast paced um, research. And that's why I wanted to do something to um, contribute to that. Yeah. And how about you, Jordan? How'd you get started on your senior fellowship? Yeah, so I guess for me, like I'm a modified major. So I'm a history major modified with English as well as African-American studies and art history. So I always knew that I wanted to do interdisciplinary work. Um, and so senior fellowship seemed like a great option for that. And also once I, I met um, Celeste Jennings, who was the 2018 senior fellow my freshman year before she graduated. Um, and seeing what she was able to do with Citrus gave me a lot of ideas for my own work, even though I decided to create an essay collection um, and she created a play. And Mike, how about you? So I started working um, on this project generally in my like sophomore year with a stamp scholarship. And then um, after that, I also did projects in the economics department as well as the environmental studies department. And then around the winter of my junior year, um, after speaking with professors in both the economics and ENVS department, I realized that the senior fellowship was kind of the perfect opportunity to extend my project into a year long um, body of work, uh, kind of as a capstone to all the work that I've been working on around tiger conservation over my four years at Dartmouth. And Muriel, what made you want to do a senior fellowship? One of my NAS professors, Colin Calloway, um, has been so supportive of me the whole time I've been here. And he suggested I might be interested in this. And he said that um, a NAD who's already graduated, Karen Casper had done this mm -hmm. with NAS in linguistics. And that was exactly what I was interested in. And so I thought I could do something for my own language. So all of you had to submit a proposal to the Committee on Senior Fellowships when you applied. Um, what we found over the years that often senior fellowships don't look the same at the end as they did at the beginning. So what I'm wondering is, is has your project or your perspective on your project changed since you started? And was that like a sudden drastic change or did it just sort of shift a little bit over time? 
Or were you one of the lucky few who did exactly what you thought you were going to do? So uh, Kenzie, let's start with you. Yeah, that's a really good question because with COVID research, of course, it was like just rapidly changing both in terms of how the pandemic was going and also the sorts of research that was being published. And there would just be like 20, 30 preprints coming out, being posted online every day. So my project definitely changed. I guess I want to say it changed, but like just grew very organically as um, the pandemic went on. So initially I was focused more on, of course, like more biological side of the virus. But as we see this emergence of variants, then naturally my project has also shifted to trying to map out these antibodies and their response against these variants. So it was a very organic growth, but yeah, it was not a surprise. And of course, I'm also only in my second term mm -hmm. of my senior fellowship. So it may very well continue to change. <laughs> I think everybody is thinking back like, gosh, I wish I was in my second term and could, you know, have a little more time. Um, so Jordan, how did your fellowship change? Yeah, um, so I would say that first, like COVID had a huge impact on, I think the initial shift from like what I originally proposed because the essay collection wasn't necessarily affected directly by the pandemic, but my original vision for a digital exhibition that would showcase some of the work had to shift. So now that project is online versus what was originally, I imagined it being more like a curated thing that people could come see. But I think other than that, some of the kind of major changes I think have been more so in terms of my thinking as I've kind of allowed the research to, to shift the way that I'm approaching the work. Um, and so I think I've welcomed those changes more than anything. And Michael, I know your project got affected a lot by the pandemic. So how did your project change from now until where we are, or from then until where we are now? Yes, definitely. So my project looks almost entirely different than what I originally thought it would look like. Um, a part of my original proposal was spending a couple months in India and Indonesia, which obviously was not possible because of the COVID pandemic. Um, and so as a result, not only did I kind of shift to a more remote uh, research approach when it came to tigers, I also added an entirely new species and basically turned my senior fellowship <laughs> into a comparative study between cougars and um, tigers. And prior to this, I'd worked with tigers for three years, three, four years, but I had no experience working with mountain lions. Um, and as a result of, of the travel restrictions, I stayed domestic, uh, went to Colorado um, and did camera trapping work with um, some experts out in Colorado, as well as camera trapping work on lynx and bobcats um, in the New Hampshire and Vermont area. So uh, definitely reimagined what I thought I was going to do. I added in mainly cougars, but also lynx and bobcats as uh, other cats that I was considering the relationship between them and the communities around them. Uh, but in the end, I think it actually worked out really well, gave my project a little bit more focus than I think I had before. Um, you know, I could really nail down on a few specific areas and then compare uh, the two different big cats between those. But overall, I still ended up getting the same uh, field work experiences I'd hoped to get, um, only in a bit colder environment than uh, the Indian jungles. So it ended up working out really well. But uh, and my time in Colorado was great as well. So it all worked out. And you only mentioned cats, but I definitely saw a picture of you in an online article with like bears climbing on you. How did the bears come into it? Yeah, so I guess a whole nother aspect of this is um, my project was supported not only by Dartmouth, but also by National Geographic. And I was originally hoping to go to India and Indonesia, specifically India with National Geographic on a project they're working on as well and kind of accomplish um, you know, both objectives. But what ended up happening is similar to my project, which was unable to be carried out in the field in India, um, National Geographic's story was also not able to be done. And so it kind of worked out perfectly because I was already working with that team and we just had a, some brainstorming sessions and the main, um, the main person who leads that team, Steve Winter, is based out of the New York area. And so I mentioned to him, maybe we could do a project in the New England space um, and National Geographic happened to be putting out grants for people to work on projects in their local areas. Um, and so Steve and I, along with a few other people in the National Geographic community, 
started a new project um, looking at New England wildlife. And so for me, it worked well because I was able to fold in bobcats and lynx from a um, cat perspective. But also, um, I got involved with some other animals that I did not expect to be working with this term, like you mentioned, um, black bears at the Kill and Bear um, Center. So I got to spend a lot of time with these orphaned black bear cubs um, at a facility that basically uh, takes care of them for about a year and a half um, in their first year and a half of life after their mothers have abandoned them or, or gotten killed and then releases them into the wild. Um, so actually, uh, in a couple of days, I'm going to be helping with one of the first releases of this season where they're releasing some of the year and a half old bears into um, into state park and national park areas. So that's definitely been an unexpected turn of events that's kind of folded in and added to the field work component. Uh, but something that certainly would not have happened if not for the senior fellowship. Okay. Muriel, um, so how did your project change from when you first proposed it to now? It's also very different. I had planned to go to different indigenous communities and also to Italy to study Montessori and Reggio Emilia schooling, but all of that got canceled. And um, I tried to work over Zoom, like video calls, um, but I also wanted to be kind of cognizant of the fact that these communities were also in crisis. So I worked a lot more with my own community and um, just being able to see like what we were doing. Um, I've been involved with summer camps and immersion work with kids before for Hoopa language, but I was able to just really devote myself to that. And so my work turned into much more like narrative, much more learning about language methods and practicing them and then making materials for camps and the kids around those methods. So it was really rewarding. So in addition to uh, the ways that your projects changed over time, were, was there anything that was really an unexpected challenge and the pandemic doesn't count because, you know, that was everybody. So Jordan, did you run into any unexpected challenges? And if you did, how'd you deal? Yeah, um, I would say that I don't know if I would call it an unexpected challenge, but I would say it was certainly like something that I didn't um, maybe I didn't like fully understand like how much it was going to factor into my experience. But something that was really significant for me was really adjusting to, I think, the scope of what I wanted to do as far as the essay collection um, and realizing just how different um, writing like a uh, like long form essays would be compared to, I think what was my kind of sweet spot, which um, as a freelance writer, I had gotten really good at that kind of like 1500 word quick essay. Um, and I think my academic work had always been long, but it wasn't an essay form. It was like, you know, these kind of long academic papers. And so I think it was unexpected or unanticipated like how much I'd have to bring together both parts of, of my writing experience um, and the ways that that would challenge me to really think about how to write at length creatively without necessarily losing that like academic or like intellectual rigor. Interesting. And Michael, how about challenges for you? Um, I think something that was interesting for me is with the introduction of new cats, I started to venture into a territory that I didn't really have a lot of experience in. And unlike tiger conservation, where pretty much everyone's on the same page, they're an endangered species, Working with cougar conservation and cougar management was definitely um, a totally new experience for me because there are people all across the spectrum. So people, some people hunt them, some people hate them and think they should be wiped out in their areas because they kill livestock. Others are avid supporters and conservationists similar to um, tiger supporters. So I think something that was interesting was working and a challenge for me was working with the species that there isn't a accepted narrative on. It's not like everyone's on the same page on the same team trying to protect it. Um, and kind of balancing personalities and different interviews and speaking to people that disagree with each other and then folding all that into, you know, single cohesive articles and um, updates on the website and things like that was something that definitely required, you know, a little bit more tact to not frustrate anyone as if they hadn't been represented or something like that. So that was new territory for sure. That's really interesting. And Muriel, how about you? What was unexpected? Um, I talked about this recently um, with some people at home, but the emotions. I've always been a very emotional person, and I've always known 
language is emotional, but just the, maybe because it was like really the only thing I was doing, um, I didn't realize why I was crying all the time or like what set it off. And my family is just so sweet. And they're like, it's okay, you can just be emotional. But I was really feeling guilty about a lot of that. And I ended up going back to therapy. But I think what helped the most was talking with other people my age who are doing the same kind of work. And I was like, oh, I'm not the only one. And we kind of talked about why we're feeling this way. There's all of this like trauma built up that's being released. It's like extremely intimate work. It's personal, like even looking through archives, like that's my like great grandpa who's talking and he's talking more or less to me. So it, it was a lot, it was a lot. <laughs> yeah, and I think for, all of you, you know, there's there's the piece that you're talking about of uh, everything that happened over the past year with just like heightened emotions across the country, but also the degree to which you really care about these projects. Like this is the culmination and you care deeply in a way that you might not care as much about an assigned paper. So the stakes do feel higher and like, you know, it feels more meaningful. So Theo, how about you? What was unexpected? Um. In terms of the pandemic and stuff, my lab work got canceled, so I had to change a bunch of um, like the data sets that I was working with and things, which gave me a chance to read a lot about areas that I hadn't read about as much before and like work with some existing data sets. Um, but I think mostly what was unexpected is that I hadn't done a lot of scientific writing before. I had done a lot of writing in other courses, um, but not like science-based writing, especially in terms of writing a scientific paper and how to structure that and organize my thoughts and be really concise and coherent in what I was trying to say was was pretty difficult for me. Um, and it's something that I've been like working a lot on over the past year. Yeah, that is hard, a whole different type of writing. I think really all of you, a whole different type of writing. And Kenzie, I know you're only partway through, but challenges, anything specific? Um, I wouldn't say, I think a lot of my challenge was actually before the project because I had submitted my proposal at the end of um, July, I think, but I wasn't starting until the winter and obviously a lot had changed between August and winter. So, and at the same time, I, I was not in lab then because of COVID restrictions. So I guess some of the challenges was just like completely restructuring my project and also trying to find a way to stay scientifically relevant in my project because it was really hard to find a niche when you feel like every other person in the field of viruses and immunology is now working on COVID 24 seven and publishing 24 seven. So trying to find a project where you know you're not going to get scooped in two weeks, first of all. And then second of all, like it being something that can still be done from my perspective at Thayer, because the other thing is a lot of these other labs have, for example, 20, 30 postdocs who are just working and churning out these papers in a very productive, systematic way. And then trying to find a more exploratory, but still interesting angle, but that still has an application for people and like for just the pandemic in general. So that part was definitely challenging. And yeah, also was not, like it was mostly on me, I guess, because it wasn't like my advisor could devote the time to think of new projects. So it was like a little bit overwhelming initially because of just how much literature there is out there and trying to consume all of that every day and like staying on top of that and coming up with new ideas while integrating all of the like research that's already been done. Yeah. yeah, and you mentioned your advisor there. So that's the next question that I'd like to ask. What was the role of your advisor? I mean, basically you worked with one person in a really all encompassing project all year. What was that like? How did that work? Um, what were the rewards? So Mike, let's start with you there. Sure, well, I love Professor Jones. Um, I have worked with him well, actually, my whole idea of working with tigers in the academic sense started in my freshman year in his class. 
um, where we had to come up with a sample project um, and like propose a research plan. Um, and then, although the research plan is d d definitely different than I originally proposed it, it's it's been fun working with him really for the better part of three years on on this topic. And I think over those three years, I have gotten better about knowing when to ask for help and um, you know when to reach out to him. And I think he has definitely um, kind of not gotten better, but learned the best ways to help me. Um, so I've really appreciated him uh, always reaching out or commenting on things when he thinks something needs to be changed, but also kind of respecting that this is my project and, you know, letting me kind of work through some of the challenges rather than just uh, always, always diving in to change things. So um, definitely super appreciative of, of all the help he's given me on this project. And I'm excited to keep him looped in on all the work I'm going to do after this and kind of always have him as a, a sounding board for anything in this more academic space around uh, big cat conservation. And Muriel, how about you? What was the role of advisors and how that worked out? So my primary advisor was Nick Rio, and then my secondary advisors were Laura McPherson, who's in linguistics, and Sienna Cray, who's in anthropology, that I met in New Zealand on the Ling and Anthro study program. And I think that they all um, worked with me a pretty like even amount. So Nick, obviously he does Anishinaabe Mo and language revitalization. Um, he knows everybody, or it seems like he knows everybody in the language revitalization world. He was able to connect to me, connect me with some people um, from his Anishinaabe communities. And then Sienna also has a lot of language um, contacts, so she was very helpful with that. Um, but Nick's role, I think, was more, um, he helped me with all of my like theory and methodologies, you know, he's very steeped in this indigenous literature, obviously, but he helped me find people from my community, so, um, somebody that I work off of a lot, Ketcha Risling Baldi, who I actually know, like she's one of the ceremonial families. I've known her since I was little. And he showed me like, oh, this is all the theory work she's written. And I was like, oh, well, I know that she talks a lot about that, but I didn't realize this is like academic work. So that was just amazing. And then Sienna has been so good at helping me with my writing, with my self-reflection, with staying on top of things over everything. And then Laura, her background is linguistics. Um, she's actually studied my language a lot over this past year. So she really understands what I mean when I say, well, there's this methodology that works this way. Do you think that it'll work for my language if it's not like English? So that's been their role. And Theo, um, what was it like to work with your mentors? Like what was the role as you moved along through this project? Yeah, um, my primary advisor is Professor Keller and then uh, Professor Slotsnick is my secondary advisor. So they've both been really, really great to work with. I admire them a lot as people and as scientists. So it's been great to like get to learn so directly from them, especially since they're both pretty young professors here, like getting to, figure out exactly what it is that they do and what they are most interested in, uh, especially like before they have a chance to teach a whole bunch of classes and things has been a lot of fun. Um, and they've both been really great about kind of letting me figure out what I'm most interested in, in like the topic that we've been exploring and being supportive of the directions that I want to take things in. Um, I think it's been especially interesting with all of the remote schooling this year that like I can't drop into their offices all the time like I used to and just kind of adjusting to having less of a like I guess daily interaction in that way and being more intentional about how we interact and like what we talk about and what we get done in specific meetings but yeah I think that it's been fantastic to work with them and learn from them and I'm really grateful for all the time that they've spent on this with me. And, and Kenzie that that not having your advisor like right there is part of what you talked about as well. So how did, um, like what was the 
what was your relationship with your advisor? Like, how did that work? Uh, you able I to guess, uh, from what I've heard of everyone else's, I think my relationship was a little bit different because like, I guess I had a lot of ideas going in and experience going in. And so I really just wanted, like, I was basically pretty independent in the lab and my advisor was also a very hands-off advisor. So that worked out really well for us where basically we left each other alone for most of the time. And we only like checked in for 15 to 30 minutes a week, um, just in case I had any questions. And basically I would just give her a brief update and be like, this is what I'm planning to do. Are you okay with direction that I think makes sense? But do you think it makes sense? And it should just be like, confirm that or provide some additional suggestions, which are sometimes very helpful when I like hit um, roadblocks along the way. But other than that, it's, yeah, I've been able to just like think about things by myself and like organize and pace everything um, in the way that I wanted. Yeah. So I think it worked out for both of us. <laughs> And Jordan, you had a very interdisciplinary project with two advisors in, involved in very different ways. So how did that work out? Yeah, um, I would say that like my advisors are like both like amazing, uh, super, super helpful. Um, so I had, uh, I worked very closely with my primary and secondary advisors, which were Professor Bethany Morton and Professor Joshua Bennett. Um, and I, it was really important to me to have advisors from different disciplines um, so that I could get feedback on different facets of the project. Professor Morton has like such a wealth of knowledge as far as like history and American studies goes. And she was super, super helpful for helping me to ground my project in history, even though I was doing mostly cultural criticism work. And Professor Bennett, like his wealth of, I think, knowledge around craft was really important to me as well. Um, and also his background in kind of black literature was also really central to how I wanted to do my work. Um, and also to, to, to name some people who were also really helpful for me in addition to those two, um, Professor Kimberly Juanita Brown in the English department was also amazing. And she was super helpful with the visual culture components of my work. Um, and also Professor Samantha Shepard, who's a Dartmouth alum who teaches at Cornell. Um, she's a Mellon fellow. And so I reconnected with her through Mellon and she was also super helpful as like a film and media studies person who was able to help me a lot with some of the more um, like film criticism heavy components of my project. So I had a lot of really amazing people um, pitch in throughout this process. So I'm super grateful for all of them. Yeah, and it does seem like you you really have to find your advising and find your relationship with the people that you need to work with. So um, did I miss anybody on any of the questions? I think I rotated around. Okay, so the next two questions I'm gonna ask are, um, and just to give you a second to think about it, um, what advice would you give to somebody who's thinking about a senior fellow? Like, what do you wish you had known going in? And then after we do that one, I'm gonna ask you what you're doing after graduation. And if you wanna, if you'd rather not say, you don't have to, that's fine. Um, I know this is a weird COVID year where not as many people may have, may know what they're gonna do when they graduate. Okay, so what advice would you have for somebody who is starting a senior fellowship or thinking about a senior fellowship? Like, what do you wish you had known when you went in? I think the advice that I'd have for someone who is about to start on a senior fellowship would be don't be afraid of change. Um, hopefully you won't have to change your project as much as some of us did due to these crazy circumstances, but regardless of pandemics and things, there'll always be problems and surprises and rabbit holes that pop up along the way. And I think the point of a year long project, at least in especially more interdisciplinary fields is having the flexibility to actually go down those, you know, those pathways and explore the unexpected pop-ups. And you might find, you know, ways to fold that into your project, or you might find that it's not really relevant. But I think taking the time to explore and look at your, your topic through a variety of different lenses will lead to some um, surprising, surprising results and probably stuff that will make your ultimate final product, um, you know, a more compelling piece. Jordan, what would your advice be? So I would say I would probably give two pieces of advice. Um, first, I would say that like, it's really, really important to know 
how you get your work done and whether or not you're someone who is like intrinsically motivated um, because like it really is a very independent project um, and process. And so as, as we've already stated, like, you know, our advisors have been super helpful, but like these really are projects that you're doing by yourself and like no one's gonna hold your hand. So I think like really knowing like how you work is crucial. And then the second part, I think is really just kind of narrowing down what is like integral to the work you're doing and what aspects of your project you're willing to, um, to change over time and what things you feel like are actually really important um, to hold your ground on. How about you, Mira? What's your what, what's your advice? I would say keep a journal and keep a journal like it's gonna go in the archives. Um, one of my um, language activist friends, I guess, got me this really nice journal and archival like, quality paper and a nice pen. And that was the advice she gave to me. And it's been so helpful in my writing to be able to go back to my very early days Anytime I had an idea, I would jot it down in there. So it's all like in this one place. Yeah, and then at the end, you can really look back and see your journey. And it's really sweet. Journey. How about you, Theo? What would, what would your advice be? Um, I think being really cognizant of time is important. Like we had a lot of deadlines that we had to meet and things, but also like a year went a lot faster than I thought it was going to. And there would be things that would come up that I was like, Oh, I'd love to keep working on this or like go off in that direction or whatever, but that would take, you know, more time than I had. It would take like a few years to work on or whatever. And like it at some point has to be done, I guess. Like you have to be okay with making a final product at some point and having it be over and like things that you could build on in the future, but have something that you're proud of as a complete unit at the end. You'll, if you go to grad school, that's going to be, you know, you get to the thesis and you have to be like, uh, I just have to stop. Kenzie, what's your advice? I know you're not totally done yet, but what do you wish you'd known before you started? Yeah, I guess a lot of what um, everyone else has already covered. And maybe just to add on from an experimental perspective, which is a little bit different, is that like a lot of times things just don't work. And you will be like, there are times when I just felt so like depressed and like in despair because it's 2 a.m. in the lab and you're like just you and the machine and like nothing is working. And you just like in your mind, you're thinking like, is this ever going to work? Because nobody has ever done it. So it's possible that it just does not work ever. And just having to like live with that and try to go back and problem solve. So I guess my advice is, like, even when that happens, it's not the end of the world. If you feel like you've just wasted two or three weeks or a month going down this path that you just like felt like did not produce any results because that's just how the way science works. And yeah. And in the end, you still get results. It's not like in the midst of it, you'll just feel like a complete failure, but <laughs> it's not the way it works. And then like, for example, three months later, when you look back, you realize you actually still accomplished a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I remember somebody telling me in grad school that if every experiment worked out the way you thought, there would be no point in doing it because you could just say, well, I already know what's gonna happen. So it's, it's always the unexpected. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna run through and um, maybe I'll sort of go up and down and end with you, Kenzie, is uh, what are you planning to do after you graduate? So Muriel, let's start with you. Yes, so next year I received a Lombard Fellowship through Dartmouth. So I'm going home. I'm continuing doing Master Apprentice, learning Kuba language from my dad. And I'm continuing working with the Tribal Ed Department in Kuba. And my work with the Lombard Fellowship will kind of be with all of that. And I'm going to be creating a seasonal curriculum for Kuba language classes and working with some of the teachers. Yeah. Nice. Jordan, how about you? Yeah, so uh, in the fall, I am going to graduate school. I committed a couple weeks ago to um, do a PhD program in English at Harvard. So that's where I will be. And um, thank you. Uh, and in addition to that, I uh, 
definitely plan to continue doing all of the freelance work I've been doing, um, especially to branch out into different genres. So in addition to essays, I also am going to keep working to publish fiction and poetry as well. So I'm excited about that. That's great. Theo, what are you going to do next year? Uh, I'm going to be going to Princeton for a PhD in geosciences. Uh, I'm going to be working in a geochronology lab and that's kind of like producing the data that I've been analyzing this past year. So then doing a lot of like compilation work this year and now I get to go actually generate some of the data that I'm really excited about. That's awesome, especially since you didn't get to go to the lab this winter. Like great that you get to go back to grad school. And Mike, what are you gonna do? So over the course of senior fellowship, um, and the people I was working with at National Geographic, we actually started a nonprofit called Big Cat Voices, um, which does the same thing that I had originally proposed in my senior fellowship, making stories about um, big cat conservation and big cats more engaging and accessible to people around the world. So I'm working with a team of uh, other explorers from National Geographic and people around the wildlife media world, as well as um, some scientists in the space to get this nonprofit off the ground. Um, and then I will also be continuing to work with National Geographic, um, both wrapping up the story up here in New England and also going to India once the COVID situation clears up to um, film and work on a uh, product there on the last population of Asiatic lions. Uh, and then other than that, um, because that might not take up all my time, I'll just have a, a more typical job in the uh, energy consulting and consulting world. Um, but they've been pretty supportive of all the work I'm doing, so I won't be working full time there um, as I'll be spending a couple months of the year in the field working on uh, Big Cat Media. And Kenzie, I know you've still got a little bit of time left, but what are your plans? What are you thinking you'll do after you graduate? Yeah, so. Initially, I had applied to grad school, and so I committed to um, going to Scripps Research Institute in San Diego or La Jolla, California. But then I decided to defer grad school for a year to be able to work, to continue to work on SARS-CoV-2 at um, Adamab, which is a local biotech company, and also its spinoff called Adagio Therapeutics, where we have a broadly neutralizing antibody that sort of covers all the variants and also pre-emergent future viruses that may spill over from bats or pangolins. So I have a role there as a um, preclinical in preclinical virology. So helping to bridge the preclinical to the clinical and as we're starting um, human trials now. So doing a lot of support work for that, which is really exciting. And so yeah, I had actually been working at Adamab um, since my junior year of Dartmouth. So I'll just be continuing that for the next year and then going to grad school next fall. Yeah. Nice. Okay, so that's all the questions I have. Does anybody have any last things you wanna to toss in here? Anything you wanna say? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to see somebody using those senior fellow rooms. Has everybody been over there yet? Yeah. Good. Yeah, I know it's 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 one of the really nice things about the senior fellowship program is that chance to all be together. And, you know, that's one of the things that we all kind of missed in COVID is not like seeing everybody. But, oh, well, a virtual year and we'll have a virtual symposium and but you'll go on to like other things and continue your projects. Thank you so much for joining us and celebrating the accomplishments of this year's senior fellows. We congratulate them on their achievements and we wish them the very best in their future endeavors. Thank you.